Tonight's um, so Scholar's Choice social, um, or webinar rather, educational webinar is titled The Social Media Safety Zone, Pointers to Protect Kids from Digital Dangers. And I'd like to get, invite uh, and introduce our guest experts now. Tonight we have the honor of having Shanna Burns and Ryan Brohl of the Cam H Center for Prevention Sciences with us. I'm going to share some background on Ryan first, and then I'll speak about Shanna. Ryan is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at Western University and a research associate at CAMH Center for Prevention Science here in London, Ontario. He has co-authored research papers and book chapters in the areas of cyberbullying, media violence, family violence, the internet, and the, the list goes on. And Ryan was also recently featured, featured as a cyberbullying expert on CTV News in the show Beyond the Classroom. So Ryan will be joining us in a moment. Our second guest expert tonight is Shanna Burns. Shanna is an educator and researcher at the CAMH Center for Prevention Science. She holds her Bachelor of Education and Masters in Educational Psychology, which she applies in her, in, in her work in the area of the fourth R program development and, and implementation initiatives. That's an, an initiative that's actually being rolled out right now, right across the province of Alberta uh, in, in, in schools out there. And I know um, Ryan and Shanna will speak more about this program. She is a fourth hour master trainer and an, and an occasional teacher with the 10th Valley District School Board here in our local area in, uh, in London and area. So, so Shanna and Ryan, uh, welcome to the call. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for having us. Yeah, you know, last week, um, Ryan and Shannon, really for, for everybody, I, I came across uh, a video, um, a, news, a news video, where basically it was uh, a news crew did an experiment online where uh, they, they went online and went to a social, like a popular social networking website and they found a kid's photo and through this type of technology um, that's really available um, if you research it they were able to backtrack, all as an experiment, they were able to backtrack um, the, where this, the picture of this, of this kid who might be nine or 10 years old, this child, they were able to, able to backtrack that photo right to that, that um, girl's home address. And the news crew, as part of the, you know, the editorial and, and to, to really punch the point home, they showed up at the at the parent's house and, the, and, the, and, I, and I, so I'm watching this news clip and the, the mother is completely alarmed. Um, and I saw that just this last week and it had to do with how the child was using her cell phone and posting photos online. So there was a certain setting that she was using that was giving um, people access to information about her whereabouts uh, that probably she and her parents would not um, want to have out there in the, in the public domain. And I thought, you know, I thought this was kind of a good prelude to this topic tonight because this is really becoming a pretty serious issue, isn't it guys? Yes, definitely. And we're really happy that we're able to uh, share some of the stuff that we've learned over this, over the years with everyone tonight. Great. Okay. Well, well, thank, thank you for being here. Great. So to get started, um, this is a social networking and online safety uh, kind of webinar. We are going to review, um, you know, a lot of what we know about social networking and online safety, but mainly we're going to start off by um, informing everybody about the dangers and then we're going to move through um, some of the tips and strategies and um, lessons that we've learned and some um, resources that are available to everybody out there um, to help you stay safe. Okay. So I'm going to start off by um, telling everyone a little bit about the fourth R. And so we're part of the CAMH, so Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and our center is called the Center for Prevention Science. And we're a research center, and we developed a program called the fourth R. And what the fourth R stands for is uh, relationships. So just like reading, writing, arithmetic, um, our contention is that the fourth R is relationships and that all uh, problem behaviors start 
um, and are founded in relationships. So we're in London, Ontario, and um, it's a the, the fourth hour is basically a health promotion and uh, violence prevention programming for youth, and it um, uses best practice initiatives uh, and approaches to target multiple forms of violence, like bullying, dating violence, peer violence, and group violence. We feel that by building healthy school environments, we can provide opportunities to engage students to develop healthy relationships and uh, decision making to provide a solid foundation for their learning experience. And by increasing youth relationship skills and targeting risk behavior with a harm reduction approach, um, we can empower adolescents to make healthier decisions about relationships and substance use and sexual behavior. All of our fourth art programming is skills based and addresses the triad of risk behaviors, um, which focuses on the theme of relationship that underlines everything. Um, we place an emphasis on positive youth development and youth engagement. And the school-based versions are connected to curricula. They meet learning standards and satisfy ministry expectations, and they're taught by teachers, um, whereas community-based versions of the program are taught by community professionals who, can, who work with youth. Um, it is a prevention program. It's not an intervention program. Um, so the model that we have is universal, um, with the understanding that everybody can benefit from learning these kinds of lessons. And uh, the variety of adaptations and extensions, the program started with a grade nine health program um, that we developed. And then uh, to date now we have programming for grade seven, eight and nine health, grade nine through 12 English. Um, we have an enhanced program for Aboriginal youth and for youth in an alternative education setting, as well as um, other uh, non-curriculum based programming such as peer mentoring programs, a uh, small groups program, a healthy relationship plus program that has an enhanced mental health and suicide prevention focus, and then we have um, some youth safe schools uh, programming as well. Um, our implementation started in Ontario, uh, spread through British Columbia, Saskatchewan into the U.S., and as of March 2013, we have over 4,000 teachers trained to use the program um, from over 3,000 schools. So uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, the evidence base with our program. We are um, we continually evaluate our program. In 2004, we did a, a randomized control trial in Ontario on the grade nine health program. Um, so it was a two-year study, and we followed the students um, and collected data from 1,800 youth, and then followed up with a, followed up with them again two years later. Um, and then last year, we did a randomized control trial in Saskatchewan on our grade eight health program. And we do have plans to do a randomized control trial on the grade seven, as well as our Healthy Relationships Plus program. Um, currently in Ontario, we're completing a, we're in our second of three years of our longitudinal study for our Aboriginal programming, and uh, we continually conduct focus groups and implementation and satisfaction feedback from facilitators, teachers, and students um, about our programming, just so we can always be uh, continually updating it. All of our results are of the various studies are published and available on our website, and um, we do continue to put an emphasis on evidence-based programming, and that's earned us spots on various nat national registries, such as uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada's Promising and Best Practices Portal, Public Safety Canada, um, Model Crime Prevention Program, SAMHSA's um, National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, and the National School-Based Mental Health and Substance Abuse Consortium. So that's a little bit about the fourth hour program. And um, Shanna, and I had one, one question from Teresa here in, uh, here in Canada. She was wondering if this curriculum is also applicable for toddlers and preschool age. And I guess that opens up a bigger question for everybody. What, what are the main um, years or ages that this program is applicable for? Um, currently, our fourth hour program, um, because we're grant funded, we've only received funding to develop programming for students from grades 7 through to 12. Um, we do have some resources that we're going to share with everybody and some websites, some web links of other research that we've, or sorry, of other lessons that we've produced um, that are accessible for youth in grade uh, JK through to grade 12. But that's towards the end of the presentation. We'll offer those. Okay, great. I think that'd be helpful to, to everybody if we covered mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about um, healthy youth relationships, the uh, in today's world anyways, the obvious next step is to talk about healthy relationships online. And we know that a lot of online relationships now or digital relationships are taking place through social media. We always like to start with this little did you know. It really, I, I think we all know that social media is a big part of 
kids' lives and our lives, but we don't always, uh, I guess, realize the extent to which it is part of our lives. So this kind of helps to put it into perspective for us. ABC, CBS, and NBC, uh, as I'm sure you know, are three very large, uh, very big, very popular American TV networks. The biggest shows are usually on those three networks. And every single month, they get about 28 million unique visitors to their websites. So what that means is that 28 million different people go to their websites every month. And that number has risen considerably in the last couple of years as these, um, these networks have started to uh, stream TV shows and, and other uh, programming online. Mm -hmm. Now, these websites have been around for a combined 200 years. So, you know, 28 million people is a, an awful lot of people going to those websites, and 200 years, they've been around for a while. What's really interesting is that you compare that number to the number of unique visitors going to Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook every single month, and that's about 375 million different people going to those websites every month. We'll talk about it later, but uh, Facebook has well over a billion users itself now, and this is the number going every month. And not a single one of those websites existed nine years ago. It's just wow. in, you know, less than a decade. That's, you know, the impact that these have come to have on our lives. And it's, it's really just staggering um, how many people are, are using social media on a very regular basis. To pick up where Ryan left off, um, here's a quote from Drew Altman, uh, President and CEO of Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, the amount of time young people spend with media has grown to where it's even more than a full-time work week, and when children are spending this much time doing anything, we need to understand how it's affecting them for good and for bad. Um, so tonight, uh, you know, we wanted to say that we totally agree with the statement, and what we feel is that you know the topic should be a priority for everyone. And while not all media, we're not saying that media is bad or the internet is terrible, but we're saying that um, everybody needs to acknowledge how much time youth are spending and help educate them on what they're doing. We do know now that uh, by the time youth graduate from secondary school, they'll have spent 15,000 hours with media and only 12,000 hours in the classroom. So here's some stats on uh, social media. So you spend an average of eight hours per day with media, and this accounts for um, multitasking, so meaning when youth are using their phone and listening to the music or watching TV while they're on Facebook. If we were to break out the amount of time they use their media, youth would be consuming 11 and a half hours of media per day. We can compare this to how many hours we know that they're in school. And we can also um, Note that this doesn't include texting, and we know you've sent an average of 3,000 messages per month, according to research done by wireless carriers such as TELUS, Rogers, or Bell. Um, but there's many free texting apps, so we don't really know the full extent of their texting. You know, and you can compare this to about one hour that you spend on chores or homework. Um, we know that 90% of youth uh, use social networking sites, and 22% of teens check their social networking sites about 10 times or more per day. And I'd say that that might even be on the low end of how often they check. Um, the average Facebook user views uh, 1,281 profiles per year. Um, on average, most youth have between 500 and 700 friends. So given that, they're creeping at least 500 plus other people annually, so that, that meaning that they're looking at about 500 uh, people that they don't have as their friend, looking at their Facebook pages and kind of checking them out. Um, these technologies and abilities to creep or spy um, create a generation of youth who don't have the same boundaries about space and privacy, so we want to make sure that we're educating them on those things, that you know the concept of what's personal and what's public um, isn't always common sense, so uh, we need to make sure we're watching that technology. Um, we know that 39% of youth are posting or sending sexually suggestive messages or images, or they're sexting. Um, so again, that personal and public realm it's, there's kind of a blurry line there for some youth. 44% of youth say that they know that this message will be shared with somebody else. Um, so when they send these messages or pictures, they know that they're going to be forwarded, and uh, that's a little bit scary too, because that's still a decision that they've made that they want to send that. Um, what's also important to know is that while most of the images are being circulated of girls, boys are still doing these things as well. The biggest difference we've heard of is that um, most girls and boys will keep or forward an image of a girl more readily than they would of a boy. And lastly, among 13 to 17 year olds, uh, their favorite way to communicate with friends is in person, which is great news. 35% um, of youth say it's more fun and 29% say you can understand what people mean better. 
this is great news, um, but it still needs to be a priority to ensure that youth are learning the social skills necessary for those in-person communication since they're growing up mainly in a virtual world now. Well, yeah, and I think the antagonist of that last part there, Shan, is, is that would also mean um, 65 would, 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 would not choose it, right, as, as the uh, best way to communicate. Would that be a fair way to look at it? Definitely, yep. Yep, okay. So to pick up from um, that last number there, these are some of the ways that youth use social media now. Uh, the reality is that when we talk about safety, we tend to focus on the negative features of social media. So we wanted to spend uh, at least a couple of seconds here talking about some of the good aspects of social media. Um, I tend to, and, and Shan as well, we tend to study the ways that social media gets used to cause harm or to, uh, as part of unhealthy relationships, but they can be really, it can be a really great resource as well. Um, so odds are you'll leave this webinar today feeling like your kids or your students should never be on Facebook, should never be on Twitter, mm -hmm. should never visit YouTube again, but um, you know, it really isn't that bad. We just, um, uh, it's, or it's not bad enough to say don't use it and it's not a realistic thing to tell a kid not to use social media. Uh, it's just such a, a big part of their lives and their social world, but um, uh, you know, we, we, we will be focusing for sure on some of the negative features of it or the ways it can be used to cause harm. But the reality is that social media can be used to share, express, and talk in ways that simply were not possible before. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure when many of us were young, if we wanted to call a family member on the other side of the country, we had to dial long distance, maybe we had to dial the rotary phone, and um, you know, it was expensive to do that. Now you can have webinars like this. Now you can go on Skype. You can, you know, I have a, a 10 month old daughter. We send videos and post videos on YouTube on a private page so her grandparents can see her more regularly. Uh, you know, young people can express themselves on blogging sites. Uh, there are some really fantastic ways that teachers are using social media and uh, sites like TeacherTube to, to educate um, and, and kind of teach youth how to use social media appropriately and, and certainly they're connected to one another in ways that just weren't possible before. So it, it can be very, very positive as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now given that, social media uh, can open up a whole new world of opportunities and possibilities, but it can also create a lot of problems when it's used inappropriately or when it falls into the wrong hands. And uh, one of the things that we always talk about with the fourth R is that we need to spend time teaching about relationship skills in the same way that we teach young people to pass a puck in hockey or shoot a, a free throw in basketball or uh, you know, do a particular dance move or how to swim or anything like that. We don't spend as much time talking about relationships and we probably spend even less time talking about how to use technology safely. Uh, many young people know how to use technology probably better than a lot of adults do. So it can be a scary topic to approach, but uh, it's an important conversation to have and um, you know what research shows is that many young people actually enjoy teaching their parents about technology and it's empowering for them. So we're going to share some of the uh, darker sides of technology in the next few minutes and then we'll give some tips and suggestions and um, some things that the research and other resources shows uh, can help when we're dealing with this type of thing. So this uh, slide shows a picture of Amanda Todd. I'm sure many of you have heard of Amanda. She was the young um, student from British Columbia uh, who committed suicide in October 2012 uh, after she had posted a very, very powerful and moving video um, of herself telling her story on YouTube using only flashcards. And those are the pictures that you see around the outside there. Um, when Amanda was in grade seven, she moved in with her father uh, and she used video chat to meet new people, uh, which as many young people do, uh, it's a very popular method of, of passing the time or, or meeting new people. Uh, 
Unfortunately, a stranger on one of these chat sessions convinced Amanda to flash him. And later, uh, he told her that he would expose the topless photograph of her unless she gave him a show. Uh, you know, she uh, complied with some of his um, demands, and and, uh, and two years later, um, when she thought all of this was behind her and she didn't have to worry about it anymore, the photo was circulated to many of her friends, um, teachers, classmates, family members, uh, and as a result of this uh, quite traumatic experience, she developed a number of mental health problems um, and really battled with a number of demons as a result of what he did. Uh, a year later, the man resurfaced again using Amanda's picture, the, the topless photo of her, as his Facebook profile picture. And again, he befriended many of her friends and family members on Facebook, spreading this picture once again and reminding everybody of it. Uh, Amanda was relentlessly teased and bullied um, as a result of this. She attempted suicide and was teased and bullied further online and, and in person uh, for failing to commit suicide. She moved schools. Uh, she moved. She moved all over the place, and none of it helped. The, the online world, it's always there, um, and it, it, she couldn't get away from it. And eventually, uh, in grade 10, she did commit suicide. Amanda Todd's mother, Carol Todd, uh, said in an interview with CTV News, what goes on the internet stays on the internet. It's there forever and it damages lives. The reality is that in the past, if a picture like this was out there of your child or somebody you loved, you could find that picture, you could try to track it down and you could rip it up and that was it, it was gone. Now with the internet, anything that gets posted can be downloaded, it can be forwarded on to other people, you completely lose control of it and there's really nothing you can do to get it back. Uh, you know, all of the pictures we have in here in this presentation are from the internet. We just Googled them. And, you know, if I can download them, if I can save them and, and show them to, uh, you know, the almost 150 people that are on here now, anybody can as well. You completely lose control, and that's one of the things we really try to remind young people about. Uh, you know, we use the rule of thumb that if you wouldn't want your grandparents to see it, then don't post it online. And it's something, again, as Shanna mentioned, those boundaries we need to be thinking about all the time. So this part of the presentation is going to be uh, looking at some of the unsafe digital communications uh, that youth can get engaged in. Um, from text messaging and cell phones to social networking to hate blogs. And we're going to look at um, you know, the ways that these can lead to harassment, bullying, and compromised safety and uh, why it's important for us to um, look at some of these things so that you uh, can be sure that they are safe when they're using their media. So to start off, we're going to look at cell phones and smartphones. 77% um, of all students have their own cell phone, and most are smartphones now, meaning that they have internet capabilities. Um, older teens age 14 to 17 are more likely to have a cell phone than younger children, um, with 87% of older teens owning a cell phone. The average age that a child gets their first phone now is eight years old, which sounds very young, because what does a student in grade three really know about um, using a phone or needing a phone, but that is what they say now the average age is. Um, basically, smartphones give the world of the internet at the fingertips of young and impressionable youth. And years ago, when we were building social skills and navigating relationships, adults were always around to educate us if we spoke rudely, made inappropriate comments, things like that. Um, whereas now, youth have the freedom to communicate and uh, kind of come of age digitally where supervision is minimal, mostly because um, us adults aren't as comfortable using the digital technologies that they can use. So we don't often get en engaged the same way we would if we were seeing these things in real life. Um, I know for me growing up, there was one phone and it was in the kitchen. So if I wanted to talk, uh, it was in front of anybody that was around in that kitchen. And, you know, my family could always hear everything that I was saying. So you had to really, you know, consider what was going on. Um, now it's quite easy just to text and do, um, talk on the phone and do all the different things without anybody really noticing what's going on. Um, oftentimes with that minimal supervision, choices aren't witnessed or reviewed until it's too late. 
Um, some things I want to draw to your attention are um, new apps and technologies that are accessible as long as phones have 3G or Wi-Fi access. Um, and even consider that iPods um, are something that has a Wi-Fi access or even MP3 players. So youth can you know, log on to Wi-Fi somewhere, especially if there's free Wi-Fi if they're at Starbucks or something, and they'll have access to the internet, um, even just using you know, not a telephone. And here's some things to watch out for. Uh, some ways that youth can be communicating unsafely um, are using anonymous phone numbers. There's websites such, such as Text Them Now, Sneak SMS, and Five Digit Text. And these allow users to make their phone number private or anonymous to send text. Um, and these apps are available to do this on major smartphone platforms. Um, and you know, while parents are paying for TELUS, Rogers, and Bell services to text, many youth have figured out that by signing up for um, things like Text Plus, which is another downloadable app that's free. Um, they're able to have free texting and calling to other Text Plus users using Wi-Fi or 3G. And some users uh, will use you know, WhatsApp, which is a cross-platform mobile messaging app for iPhone, Blackberry, Android, Windows, and Nokia. So it allows those users to exchange messages without having to pay for texts. So it's basically like messaging um, each other using this particular app through this app. So the app gets all the information, but also uh, there isn't the same record of the number of texts that are being used or what kind of content is being shared in those text messages. Also, WhatsApp users can create uh, groups and they can send each other unlimited images, video and audio, media messages. And other things to think about are sites like Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, and other regular sites that youth love going to are definitely accessible on smartphones through the internet and often they have a downloadable app as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Facebook um, later in the presentation, but it is something to consider that just because you have a downloadable app, it doesn't mean it's the same as what uh, you can do on the actual computer and that goes for safety measures as well. What is um, available to us to choose as safety options or privacy options on our apps aren't are very limited compared to what's on the um, online version. So we always want to make sure we're going online and checking those things. And I just wanted to mention that what Andrew was talking about earlier, uh, the story that he shared about the young girl and um, the picture and being able to track her to her home is something called geotagging. And um, basically what that is is um, on certain phones and newer cameras, if you have something called location services or your uh, GPS enabled for your for your um, camera portion of your phone or for your actual camera, every time you take a picture, the latitude and longitude of that picture will be embedded into that image. So say for example, you know, you do have a 10-year-old daughter that's taking pictures of herself up in her bedroom and she's putting them, as youth like to call them, selfies up online on Facebook and her privacy settings aren't set very high. Um, you know, and someone's able to download that picture, if they have certain technology and um, you can just go to certain websites and download a piece of software, you're able to find out the latitude and longitude of exactly down to pretty much a foot of where that picture was taken. So it's something to consider. Um, there's lots of ways, you know, you just go online and Google geotagging and it'll tell you immediately how to turn it off. On an iPhone, you just go into your settings and your location services and you just turn it off for your camera and then you no longer have that information being embedded into your photos but I'm sure that that's how they uh, were able to track her down. Yeah, it's very likely, and I can, I can probably guess right now that every parent on this call with a child with a smartphone after this call is going, is going to go get the smartphone and do something with it. <laughs> Definitely, and you want to do it with those iPods, with anything yeah. that has, you know, anything that has a GPS in it definitely turn it off, but it is, you can access anything online uh, to, to tell you the steps to how to do it, or we can explain it to you for some phones as well. Yeah, it's gr it's great advice, um, Shanna. And is within a within a phone is it enough for a parent? So there's there's um, obviously some parents on this call who their child may have a smartphone, but they may prohibit that child from being on social networks um, like like Facebook. Is it enough for a parent to just check the phone um, periodically to see what apps that child um, has downloaded? Or is that not enough these days? And what can a parent be doing? Um, definitely checking the phone is a great start. Um, 
we have some strategies later on, but I can give you some now. For example, Googling your child to see what shows up will tell you very quickly if they have certain accounts and if they do, how high their privacy settings are. Um, sometimes youth will tell their parents one account and they'll have another account that they actually use, so watching out for that. Um, certain phones you can check the, the browser history and you can see what cookies are on the phone so you know what kinds of websites they've been visiting um, and that always kind of helps. Um, but we do have some tips um, later on that we will share that go into more detail with some other um, suggested websites to visit. Okay, great. So one of the, um, certainly stemming from that, one of the darker sides of uh, primarily cell phone use, but um, internet use, Skyping, things like that as well, is sexting. And I'm sure many of us have heard of sexting in the media. It's been a, a bit of a buzzword. It's actually a media-created word. 20% um, of 14 to 18 year olds have sent sex messages. Uh, it's very, very common in high school. It's, uh, you know, you don't really come across anybody who hasn't heard of it if you go to talk to um, high school students. 40% of students in that age range have received these messages and 25% have forwarded them on to other people. So uh, they're being circulated um, and, and to people other than the intended recipient. One of the reasons that this happens uh, is because it's con considered a form of safe sex. So uh, young girls, teenage girls um, primarily, uh, but certainly could be boys as well, are um, sending their partner nude or semi-nude pictures of themselves to avoid pressures um, to engage in uh, physical activities, um, sex, oral sex, things like that. Uh, it's, so they're considering it a safe method, but the reality is it's not as safe as they may believe it is because these messages are being forwarded onto other people and, um, you know, you know it, it certainly carries its own risks as well. What concerns us is that it's become a form of normalized behavior. Uh, you don't typically hear about uh, students calling these sex messages. Um, if you're walking through the halls of a school, you'll often hear about um, people sending nudes or, or things like that. Uh, it just rolls off their tongue. It doesn't worry them at all. Uh, and it's, a, it's just such a common part of their lives. The little picture down in the left-hand corner of your screen, the ghost in the kind of yellow box there, that's an app called Snapchat. It's an extremely popular app right now. And what it does is it allows you to send a picture of yourself to somebody else, but that person can only see the picture for a maximum of 10 seconds. Uh, so the, you know, that sounds better than them having access to the picture all the time and, and just being able to go back into their email or their messages or whatever and find it. But we have to remember that it takes, you know, maybe a second, half a second probably, to take a screen capture of your uh, smartphone screen. When they do that, if somebody does that to a picture you've sent them, they have that for forever and they can do whatever they'd like with it. It just goes into their photo gallery. So the program is uh, not safe, uh, but there's a conception, a misconception that it is a very safe way to send pictures like this. One of the consequences is that this is child pornography if the child is under 18 years old. Um, possessing, you know, Having the picture on your phone is the possession of child pornography. Sending it on to other people is um, the distribution of child pornography. And simply taking the picture is the creation of child pornography. It is serious. Po the police are cracking down. There are cases working their way through the courts in London right now. And there's a case uh, or several cases in the United States where teenagers are registered sex offenders uh, and will be for uh, quite some time because they sent a picture of their boyfriend or girlfriend onto other people, usually after they broke up with them. So uh, it's a very serious thing and it's something that uh, should worry us. And um, Certainly if you find a picture like this on your child's phone, delete it, go to the police, tell them about it right away. Don't. Uh, it's, it's not worth the risk. So social networking, just briefly, 90% of youth use social networking sites daily. So these are your Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, uh, Reddit, things like that. Um, what's really interesting to me is that 75% of homeless youth actually have a Facebook account, uh, which 
uh, I found that to be a surprising number. There are a couple of issues with social networking sites. One is oversharing. So that's just sharing too many, too much information about yourself. Uh, you know, the reality is that bullies will take whatever information they can get and twist it in a way to cause harm. Um, so just because Facebook asks you for your likes and interests, you don't have to put that in there. Same thing, you don't, and we'll, we'll, we'll go over it again later, but we really recommend that young people don't share other pieces of communication information. So, so your, your cell phone number, your email address shouldn't be visible on Facebook. Group inbox messages are sometimes used, uh, similar to hate blogs that we'll talk about shortly, um, just to cause harm, to bash people, and to make people feel bad about themselves as a form of group bullying. One issue to be aware of on, especially Facebook, is like for a post. Somebody will be bored usually, post a message um, from their profile saying something like, like for a whatever. So I, I might post like for a rating, and Shanna might then like that post that I made, and I will then rate Shanna. Most of the time it's going to be our friends doing this, and we'll get good ratings, positive ratings, things that will make us feel good about ourselves, but the reality is that if we have 500, 700 friends, we probably don't know all of them that well, and some people will say mean things to us just because they can. So I don't, I don't want to ever say that somebody's setting themselves up to be bullied, but we do have to be aware of what we're putting out there and the situations we are um, p placing ourselves in, and um, sometimes things like this can be dangerous, uh, but it is a, it's a common way of passing time for young people. So how easy is it? Uh, Facebook settings, um, there's five main settings. Some of them, depending on what uh, we use on Facebook, won't be visible. But the first one is public. That means everybody in the world, um, if the user, the online user is 18 plus, if their online age is over 18, uh, means everybody on Facebook can see them, which means that over 1 billion users can technically see that information. Um, Keep in mind that many youth go online and they go on Facebook earlier than they're supposed to and because the age Facebook requires you to be is 13, if you were 10 and joining Facebook, you pretend that you're 13, by the time you're 15, 16, you're going to actually be have an online age of 18. So if you haven't checked your Facebook settings, then that means you're probably set to everyone, or public, sorry, so that everybody in the world can see um, that information. Mm -hmm. Friends of friends means it exactly that, all your friends plus all of their friends or times all their friends. So you know if you have 500 friends and each of those people have 500 friends and that's 250,000 people can see your information. So it sounds safe, but that's really a lot of people that can see. Um, there's something called friends and networks. Networks are things like being part of Western Ontario, um, sorry Western University or being part of Fanshawe College or, or um, you know Laurier. If you're part of a certain um, network. You can even have workplace networks. There's union networks. There's um, school board networks. And so if you're part of that network, it means that all your friends plus anybody who's part of that network can see your information. So just think of an institution like Western University. Um, in theory, if there were 35,000 people there annually times, say, um, you know, 100 years of people going through the doors of, of Western or just wanting to join that network even, you might have 35 million people looking at your information. Uh, friends only sounds like a really safe option, uh, but if you don't know all of your friends that are on Facebook or you have 500 friends, you're really actually still sharing a lot of personal information with people that you probably don't need to share it with or you don't talk to that often, and that goes for us as adults as well. You know, I go by the rule of thumb that, um, you know, if I wouldn't, if I haven't had a conversation with those people or I wouldn't um, share things with them that I'm posting online when I see them in public um, or even wish them a happy birthday on Facebook, I don't, I probably shouldn't have them on my Facebook anymore uh, because I'm, I am posting information that maybe I just want my friends to know. But the best option is to customize how you share. It takes a lot longer, but it's a lot safer. Um, so you just go use the online version of Facebook, not the app on your phone, and uh, change all your privacy settings and just customize it so you can choose who you want to see things, how you want them to see things, um, and you have the choice over everything that you share on Facebook. So it's important to take control of those settings, as I was saying. Um, you know, Facebook, if it was a country, it would be the third most, third largest country in the world, quickly closing in on India and China. So you can imagine how many people are using Facebook. Um, first point to make is that Facebook changes and updates its privacy settings frequently. Uh, so when you think you have it all under control, something new is often added or a setting is changed. Um, 
lately Facebook has been condensing their privacy category, so making it harder for us to secure our profile or making it more work, but it's still worth the time and the effort. Um, some things to consider are the fact that the banner picture is visible to everybody. You can't make that, you can't change the setting for that, so you want to always have something that is uh, nondescript, images of nature maybe, or your favorite uh, music group or TV show, and that, that way it's not something that tells where you live or who you are or um, you know what you like. Um, that might be something very identifiable to you. Uh, timeline makes everything you ever posted accessible by date. So you that have had Facebook accounts for years might find themselves having to fix or repair past damages because all of a sudden all the images and posts are readily accessible. The good news is that timeline can be really slow to load, so it can be frustrating and you won't try and go back very far, but at the same time all that information is there chronologically ordered, date, month, year, so you can just click on the year 2000, you know, 2009, you can click on the month of March and you can see what happened. Um, so you want to encourage youth and us as adults to change those settings, make sure that we are reviewing the activity log to see what we've posted on other people's pages, making sure we're opting out of certain uh, posts and images on our timeline, we can select that we don't want any images from a certain person to show up or we don't want um, any new images to show up on our timeline before we have a chance to approve them. You have a lot of options like that. You also have an option to uh, limit the past posts, meaning that posts and images are still there but you just can't see them. So you limit the, uh, the amount of information that people can see um, from the past. Every time Facebook does a redesign, sometimes their privacy settings are switched back to the default settings, which are very unsafe. So we should all remember to encourage youth and ourselves to go back in to our Facebook online, um, on the internet, not on your phone, and uh, check the settings to make sure we're still uh, covered. And making sure that we know the options for privacy and the account settings and how to change those things. www.facebook.com slash help is a great place to go to when you're fixing your settings or if you want to understand what and how information is shared on Facebook. Great, I'm going to just go through these next two slides pretty quickly. They're not as, um, as popular as Facebook and I want to make sure we have some time to get to the tips and, and uh, the suggestions and ways to deal with these things. The first is anonymous social websites. These things pop up all the time. Uh, two big ones right now are Whisper and Qomi or Quomi, depending on uh, it can be pronounced either way. Um, different ones are, are popular all the time. Uh, they'll be around for a bit. They'll um, fall out of favor and something new will come up. Basically, the point we want to make with these is that if a site is anonymous or if people can ask you anonymous questions, it's probably bad site to be on. It's probably going to cause harm because when people can ask things anonymously, they ask things they would not ask in person. So it, there tends to be a lot of bullying, harassment, things like that taking place on these sites. So these are a couple of current ones to, to watch out for. Formspring was something similar that was very popular a couple of years ago. Hate blogs uh, are attacks on a person or a website. They're blogs that are made um, just to do what they, they sound like they would, to spread hate. Uh, often this involves trolling, which is just saying things to try to get a reaction, to try to cause trouble. Um, and one of the reasons that people do this is because they think they're very anonymous online. In reality, we're not as anonymous as we think we are, especially online. In fact, we're not really anonymous at all. There are um, things called IP addresses, which are similar uh, in a way to a telephone number. They're unique identifiers attached to every internet connection. So I have one right now, Shanna has one right now, you all have them. These IP addresses allow for everything to be tracked, everything that happens online to be tracked uh, through your internet service provider. So through Rogers, Bell, Telus, Shaw, whoever you might have. These um, can be used in investigations. Um, by the police. These are what are usually used to track down um, and investigate child pornography cases. Uh, and certainly I've heard of them being used in uh, situations where there's been extreme bullying happening. Uh, for example, they've been used to uh, try to track down the person who had the pictures of Amanda Todd. They've been used uh, more recently in the case of Retea Parsons, uh, the young girl who committed suicide recently in Nova Scotia. Uh, so the, the point we're, we want to make here is that you're not anonymous online. Young people aren't anonymous online, uh, even though they think they are. So we, we need to remember that um, both as 
producers of this content, but also as um, adults trying to help young people who might be working through this. There are these this material that's out there that um, can be printed off, can be retrieved if it's serious enough to go to the police or something of that nature. So now we're going to move into the tips and the strategies that we'd love to share with you uh, for how to support youth and how to help us as adults educate youth and also change our own behaviors online. We're going to go through this acronym called NETWORK and um, we'll give you lots of suggestions. So the first one, the N stands for Netiquette Matters and this is basically just young people and adults need to remember that everyone has access to the internet including family members, school officials, potential employers and law enforcement. And just because we're behind the screen doesn't mean that common sense rules and values uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so you should assume that anything that's put on the internet has the potential to be found, circulated, and saved. And we, you know, these are some of the guidelines that we encourage youth to abide by online: being genuine, no harassment, behaving ethically, etc. The E stands for educate and evaluate, uh, and these are just some good positive, helpful, fun websites um, that are uh, both educational, um, informational as well. A thin lines by MTV, it allows young people to evaluate whether they're uh, texting or um, online social media behaviors are caring or controlling and what's great about it is it gives them tips on how to change their behavior if it does find that you might be a little bit overbearing. Uh, mobile safety has tons of information on uh, safe cell phone use as does text ed. Media Smarts has a wealth of information and Common Sense Media is an absolutely phenomenal resource. We love it. It has ratings and reviews on basically anything you can imagine. It has information on movies, TV shows, uh, apps, games now even. Um, so it really allows you as parents or teachers to know the messages that young people will be receiving before they before you show them that movie, for example, or let them use that app. It's a phenomenal website. We really encourage you to check it out. The T stands for tips for digital harassment or for addressing digital harassment. And these are some things that you can do if uh, a young person comes to you and says that they are being bullied or harassed online. The first is encourage them to stop or leave, turn off their computer, turn off their phone, just get away for a bit, get away from it. Uh, do not respond. That's what the bully wants you to do. Uh, don't give them that satisfaction. Save and print everything. If you have a record of it, it's much easier for principals and VPs to deal with it. It's much easier for the police if they have that copy. That's one of the uh, good things, I guess, is that um, the evidence is there. It's, it's all there for people to, to use if they need it. We really want to encourage youth to tell a trusted adult. It doesn't matter who that adult is, and don't be offended if they don't tell you as their parent. Uh, they might tell a teacher, a coach, a brother, a sister, an aunt or an uncle, anybody that they trust. It doesn't matter who it is as long as they aren't dealing with it on their own. We really want to encourage them to block the sender. Take advantage of those features. Uh, you know, you can block people on any social media site. You can block phone numbers on cell phones. Make use of those. The person never knows you've blocked them. Check your own settings. Make sure you're private, you're secure. Change your phone number and email if you have to. Every cell phone provider in Canada will change your phone number for free if they know it's because of harassment or bullying. Know the policies of the various social media sites. We always just click agree to them and we move on to, to the fun site. We don't actually read the privacy policies or the terms of use policies. At least skim them to know what's allowed and what's not allowed on the site. Meet with school officials. Uh, in Ontario um, and other provinces, I'm not sure about the specifics, but certainly in Ontario and I know other provinces and states are moving towards this. If you, if a, a bullying incident takes place off school property but affects the school climate in any way, then school officials have a responsibility to deal with it and they take that very seriously, so involve them. Report it. Uh, use the reporting features that Facebook has to report bullying. That's one of the things you can report something as. And if it is serious enough, involve the police. They take this seriously. Uh, you know, it is illegal to threaten people, to harass people. Uh, you know, involve them if, a, if you believe a crime has occurred. 
So the W stands for ways to socialize safely. Uh, the first thing is to never use real names or personal information. Often we forget that uh, using our real name makes content easy to find on Google or other search engines. Uh, but especially because posting information that relates to us specifically uh, gives people too much information to stalk or impersonate us. Um, for example, when you post your real name plus a picture of yourself in your soccer jersey with a team logo or your school, um, you know, your school uniform or something like that, um, you've now told strangers who you are, where you live, what team you play for, and it's very easy to find you. You know, you can just Google the school, you can find out the school schedule, you can Google the um, the sports team that you play for. Sometimes they have the the tournament times or the the practice schedule posted. Just way too easy to find out that information. We also say that it's not good to post your digital communication information online as well because, you know, say somebody is bullying you via Facebook, then now you've given them also your email address and your cell phone number and all these other ways to contact you. And there's just that never-ending kind of cycle. You know, you change one thing and then you give them something else and there's more and more and more. Um, it's also, you know, these companies are selling our information. Do we really want to give them a profit from us just inputting our our information into Facebook because um, they tell us to. We don't need to put that in there, so let's not give them that kind of information to be able to sell. We want to secure the profile, like we've already mentioned, making sure our privacy settings are correct and uh, everything is safe. Uh, we always recommend not posting pictures or videos, and that's very hard because a lot of people like to use these online technologies like Instagram or Facebook to connect with people and to share with people that don't live you know, near them. The best advice we have is to make sure that you have all your settings very uh, secure so that only certain people can see those um, pictures. You can set it so that you know just family sees a particular photo album on Facebook. Just keep in mind that everything we post on Facebook or Instagram becomes their property so they can take and do with it whatever they want to if they want to make it into an advertisement, if they want to sell it. So it's just worth um, really thinking before you post something online, do you really want that to be something that could end up you know, on an advertisement that goes into a banner down the side? Um, and then you know, thinking about those online friends should be offline friends. We already mentioned that. If you don't know them, if you've never had a conversation with them, they don't need to see the information you have on your Facebook or on your um, your Instagram or any of those other social networking sites. And lastly, monitor friends' profiles. So many times we hear that kids have these very safe profiles. Their parents have done an amazing job of working with them to stay safe. And then on their friends' profile, there's a picture of them out at the party last weekend. And maybe they're doing something that's inappropriate or they're engaging in you know, substance use. Um, it's just very important to always watch what others are posting up of us as well, um, just to make sure that we're staying safe about that as well. Last uh, thing, or sorry, nope, the O, not the last one, but the O stands for Overseeing Digital Communication. Um, here's some great resources that uh, parents and adults can use in order to support youth and kind of monitor what they're doing. It's not spying. All of these resources, um, you need your, your child's permission or someone's permission in order to uh, put them on the computer or to be able to monitor their Facebook or their cell phone. So it is about open dialogue between you and youth to make sure that, you know, as you would when I was little, having that phone in the kitchen and everybody could hear, now you have, you know, these technologies to help you kind of check up. So there's a website, the Canadian, the Canadian Center for Child Protection has a lot of resources. They have some information on smartphone safety, they have information for parents on how to, um, you know, look at safety guides, mobile safety evaluations, information about technology risks and strategies uh, for safe, safe texting, things like that, how to use cell phones properly. Um, my mobile watchdog is $5 a month and uh, it's just basically monitors the kinds of information that's coming and going from a cell phone. Um, Google Stat is a suite of applications designed to bring together social media and it, they have an application called Parental Guidance and it helps you monitor youth on Facebook. You can try it for free but then it becomes a small monthly charge and you just basically, you know, you can see when your child adds a friend, puts up a status update, adds a picture and you can kind of see the information that they're posting and what they're sharing or when they're tagged in something and then that way you can monitor and make sure that it's something that you want. Um, up there. It's developed in conjunction with law enforcement, so the nice thing is you're also able to print out social media emergency reports if you need to kind of share what's going on with um, somebody else. The R in uh, network stands for research and resources. The reality is that in a, what are we at, 50, about 50 minute presentation, we can't, of course, give you all of the information. These are some other resources that 
I have a lot of information on these topics. Uh, Cyberbullying.ca is a great resource. It's Canadian. Cybertip.ca is linked to from the Canadian Center for Child Protection. It's one of their suite of sites. Uh, tons of information on, on keeping kids safe and also a way to report um, inappropriate digital behaviors. Kids of the Know is a website by kids for kids. Lots of information on how they've overcome bullying, cyberbullying, um, having pictures of themselves spread, things like that. Uh, a lot of mental health research. Um, is out there. Uh, CAMH.net is um, the site of our lar the website for our larger organization. Lots of information on mental health there. Um, Youth Suicide is a great resource. Kids Help Phone has tons and tons of information. It's really growing exponentially from when it was just a phone number. A great website to check out. Deal.org is um, a website by the RCMP uh, with information on, on youth safety in general. Uh, and a couple of websites there on text messaging language. If you aren't sure what those short forms or slang terms mean, check those websites out. They're updated all the time. And lastly, the K stands for Know What is Appropriate. These are just um, a couple of suggestions for great websites to use around the home, in the classroom. If you want to engage kids in technology um, and have them use websites that are safe and, and youth friendly. Uh, a variety of different ages there. I already mentioned TeacherTube, Discovery Kids has tons of fun information and learning, um, learning tools and, and games and things like that. One that's uh, great for kids of all ages is Think by MTV. It really encourages youth to become uh, more active producers of knowledge rather than passive um, recipients and it, it engages young people in social justice issues. Um, it's a form of a social networking site as well, so a nice way to introduce young people to those sites. So just to wrap up, here are some additional resources uh, that we have for teachers. So we've developed lesson plans uh, based on various grants or funding that we've received. So the first one is a grant we received from the Canadian Women's Foundation to develop a three-lesson uh, mini-unit on the representation of youth in media. Um, it's pretty much designed for youth Grade, uh, age 14 to 18, so even if you want to grade 9 to grade 12. It's jam-packed with information. It is definitely the type of mini unit that you can lengthen into, you know, seven, eight, nine lessons, depending on uh, what you choose to focus on. There's a ton of information packed in there to help uh, talk to youth about how they're rep represented in media and the expectations and stereotypes placed on them. The second resource is a grant that we received from the Ministry of Education, and uh, it's a we did this twice, so in 2007 and then again in 2010, lesson plans were developed uh, to talk about the impact of media violence on children and adolescents from uh, JK. So lesson plans are there and unit plans from JK through to grade 12. So there's unit plans for English or for uh, leadership courses in high school and um, there's lesson plans for you know each of the different um, brackets. So if there's like JK to K, there's one to two, a lesson plan for grades three to or two to three, four to six, seven to eight, and all the way up. So there's um, quite a few different plans and different topics um, at that web link. And the last one is uh, we were we received a grant from the RCMP to write lesson plans on bullying and cyberbullying. And so uh, that link takes you to a le one lesson plan per um, grade bracket. So it would be a lesson plan for grades uh, four to six, seven to eight, uh, nine to ten, and then eleven to twelve. There's also a lot of lesson unit plans available on sites such as Common Sense Media, Canadian Center for Child Pre Protection, and Media Smarts, just to name a few additional resources. And then just to wrap up, we just leave you with this final thought. Um, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's responsible for their own actions and, that, and own decisions, and that's what we always try and tell um, any of the youth that we work with. All of our decisions and actions, whether they take place in the real world or online, are our responsibility. So it's important to delete cyberbullying, take control of our digital behavior and networking, and uh, be the kind of person online that we are in real life. So we always ask kids to think about the worst possible thing that could happen, a knock on the door from the police, the end of a friendship, being suspended, arrested, charged, and expect that to happen. And would they still choose to post that picture, forward that image, send that text, um, write that message and then you know pause and think before they do anything using technology. This has been a wonderful um, session so far. We have a lot of comments and questions over the last hour that have poured in Shanna and, and Ryan. Um, 
And I want to I want to take this opportunity now for the next ten minutes or so and um, and share some of the questions um, with with both of you that have have come in. Um, so just going back to an to an app, I just want to start with one question an attendee had. There was an app that you spoke about, uh, and I think this is a parent that I think just wanted wants to be preventative. There was an app that um, shows um, photos for for 10, 10 seconds and then deletes the photos. Um, what what's that app called again, Shanna and Ryan? It's called Snapchat. Okay, so Snapchat um, for yeah. that person that uh, had asked that question. Now, we had a teacher, Julie, ask here in Canada if um, if she could have permission to post um, the the network acronym of some sort um, within her classroom. Um, what are what are your rules around that um, with your organization, guys, for people that want to uh, pass on some of this information? Shan, I'll let you take that one. Um, we we can have you post uh, the network acronym. Um, obviously, um, you know, just any time that any of our resources are used, we just ask that people give credit to the CAMH Center for Prevention Science uh, for the resources. Um, but definitely, you know, that information is is something that we want passed out to youth and uh, you know out there for everybody. Great. Yeah. So. Um, so, so yeah, use use something like the network, but of course, please cite Cam H um, uh, back um, since they they were the originators of it. Um, Yasmin asks an interesting question, um, Shannon Ryan. So she has a child who um, used. I think it, she never said the age exactly in the in the message, but she has a child that um, is a bit young to have a cell phone, but. Um, this child is now hitting a point where <laughs> she started to ask for one. <laughs> um, what what tips can you guys provide parents in in this case, in this situation? I guess two parts of this question. What is the right age, do you guys think, in your research? And what tips can you provide to maybe um, stop a child from, from having a cell phone if it's just if that parent really feels like um, she's, she's too young or, or he's too young? And also keeping into, into consideration probably some of the pressures, the peer pressure that children will also have because if they're asking, it probably means some of their friends <laughs> have cell phones. It's a really hard question to answer um, because every child's different and every family's different. Uh, and that's, I, it's not a good answer, but it's almost, it's a parenting decision when you feel your child's ready. So there is no, kind of ideal age. The average age is eight. Um, we can give you that number, but um, you know, does that mean that every eight-year-old's legitimately ready for a cell phone or a smartphone, you know, an iPhone or something like that? Probably not. Um, you know, uh, so there is no kind of ideal age. One of the, the, speaking to the second part of the question, some tips to kind of how to get around that. The one thing with, a, I guess, the cell phone's easier to um, prevent your child from using than other things. If they want to be on Facebook badly enough, they will find a way to get on Facebook, whether that's at school or at a friend's house or something like that. With a cell phone, most kids don't have the resources to purchase it themselves. They might be able to play on a friend's phone, uh, but to actually have one constantly is uh, more something that they require their parents for. Um, in terms of preventing them from uh, using it, we really always encourage parents to sit down and have a conversation with your child, explain why you don't feel that they're ready for a cell phone. Um, you know, it, it's, again, it might be a difficult conversation to have and they might push back a little bit, but uh, one of the things that's come up over and over and over in my research uh, in speaking to teachers and speaking to police officers as well is that uh, parents need to remember that they're parents and not friends and it's great to be friends with your your kids as well and it's great to 
uh, have them like you and things like that, but at the same time we have to parent them and we we have to look out for what's best for them. And if we really don't believe that them having a cell phone at whatever the age is is the right thing for them and for their safety, then uh, you know we need to tell them why and uh, we need to just basically not let them, which I know isn't necessarily the best answer or the, the easiest answer, but um, it's really the best tip that I can think of. Sure, sure. And on um, a segue for a question um, that Rennell asked, um, what is a typical age uh, that, that children um, should be starting to go on social networks? Is there certain an, an age that's being bounced around, guys, out there? Facebook says, Facebook says 13. Um, the reality is most people are on it well before 13. Uh, again, it, it's kind of a, a parenting decision and a family decision, and it depends on the maturity of the child. There are some people who can be, you know, probably 10 years old and use Facebook very effectively and uh, in a very safe way, and there are some, you know, 25, 30, 35-year-olds who probably shouldn't be on it because they're not mature enough. Uh, it, it really depends on the individual child's development. And I mean, certainly if you don't want your child on there until they're 13, you can always explain to them that that's Facebook's regulations. Um, yeah. Okay. Some of the research we've heard um, says that the more parents talk to their kids uh, leading up to those kinds of decisions, so as they're young, you know, asking them what their friends are like, where they're going, who they're hanging, like all those types of, you know, questions, the more likely their kids aren't going to push back when their parents want to know who they're talking to online or what they're doing or um, where they're going, same kinds of things. So, you know, starting early with kids and asking them those questions in real life, day-to-day -day stuff, I guess creates that segue for you to be able to do the same thing with their online behaviors. And I know I have uh, students that are you know, grade, or sorry, they're about 10, 9, 10, 11, they're starting to use social media by using their parents' accounts and in, in turn kind of teaching their parents how to use these um, these different programs, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or um, even Pinterest, and then in turn the parents are learning, but then um, the youth has the opportunity to kind of, you know, play around on there, and then when it's time for them to set up their own account when the parent feels ready, then um, the parent also knows what they're doing by l watching the child kind of play around. So it kind of can work both ways. But it all, like Ryan said, it depends on, you know, parenting and when you feel that your child's ready. And there are some sites, some social media sites intended for younger audiences as well. Uh, Club, Club Penguin even is for uh, quite young kids. But there are sites that allow you to kind of graduate up as well. So getting them involved in things like that can help. Good advice, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, more... Um, somewhat, uh, if I want to frame it as um, "quote unquote" serious um, comment from uh, Monica, she she shared with us that in 2004 um, she was harassed and bullied anonymously by um, by people. Um, she doesn't she she hasn't put her age here, so I'm not sure how old she she is or was in 2004. Um, she does say she did print it out and she did go to the police with this information. Um, she even said in this message here that she did receive death threats. Um, the police could not find these people, nothing happened. Um, it was a brutal and uh, very frightening time in her life. And, uh, and she's just wondering if things have changed. So I think she's also, yeah, she's also mentioning here that um, police did not take it as serious as they, as they could have back then. So have you guys, so she's wondering if things are being taken more seriously now by police. That's her question. Have you guys, so did you guys notice that in your research um, when you go back maybe 10 years ago or so, was it not that serious um, cyberbullying and, and sort of what is the environment now? So if, we're, if there are some parents on the call right now and they're, they're maybe here because their child is being cyberbullied and, and they, they might be wanting to take action, are, are police taking this more, more serious these days? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Ten years ago, cyberbullying wasn't a word. Um, you know, when you look at the research on it, it's some of the earliest research came out six, seven years ago. So, okay. uh, you know, 2004, we wouldn't have known what this was or uh, whether it was serious, whether it was real, or what was going on with it. Uh, you know, Facebook was brand, brand new. Um, 
we had never heard of anything like Amanda Todd, like uh, Retea Parsons, the Megan Meyer case from the States that some people might have, might have heard about. It was a young girl who committed suicide after some um, bullying that took place on MySpace. That, that happened in 2006, and that was really what put this on people's radar and realized that this is serious. This is something we need to take seriously. And the criminal justice response from that is, from the Megan Meyer case, uh, is pretty widely regarded as having failed completely. Um, mm. and, and so that started to put it on people's radar. Uh, every state in the United States now, or almost every state anyways, 40-something odd states, have laws, this criminal laws specific to cyberbullying. Um, we don't have a federal criminal law in Canada, but provinces have taken action, um, and there's actually been some discussion of a federal law on cyberbullying. Certainly, the resources devoted to this type of thing are, are much greater than before. But with that being said, um, there are resource limitations as well. Um, you know, in London, Ontario, for example, uh, there are two cybercrime officers for the entire city. Right. So some things do end up getting missed or dropped. Uh, you know, if there happens to be a child pornography case, that's typically going to take priority over um, a harassment case, whether it's right or wrong. Um, in the public's perception, it, it usually has to, and, and that's kind of what drives policing sometimes. But it, it definitely is taken more seriously. There are education acts now that, uh, as we talked about, require schools to intervene, um, even for things that happen online, which before, 10 years ago, that would have been very murky water to get into. So yes, no doubt about it. It's taken far more seriously now. OK. So if there's a parent or a teacher uh, on this call right now, and and they're, and they're aware of either their their child or, or a student um, being cyberbullied. What's what's the number one piece of advice that you would want to leave um, that that attendee with tonight? The piece of advice that I would want to leave, and, and Shanna might have something different. I I would say take them seriously. If they've told you that they're being bullied, especially if they've told you that, that's an enormous step for them to take. And uh, you need to take it seriously, and you need to support them. You don't have to have all of the answers for them. Um, you can, there are lots of people that you can seek out uh, who can help you, uh, whether it be police, principals, school administration, guidance counselors, things like that. But they need to feel like they're being listened to, and they need to feel like you will try to help them. Um, that's the biggest piece of advice that I could offer. I agree with Ryan, and I um, just even from my own experience with youth, um, I'd say, and then follow up as you know, as teachers, um, some and even parents were really good at trying to diffuse the situation right as it's happening. We don't often, um, some of us don't often remember to you know ask them you know a couple weeks later, a month later, um, six weeks later, how things are going, whether they're how they're handling it, how they're healing from the situation, or what's going on still. Um, so just continually following up with them um, because they do expect us to help them, but they also expect us to support them along the way. And they don't often ask for help a second or third time if it's going on. This, thank you, Shanna and Ryan. This has been a very informative, um, very meaningful uh, webinar this evening. Um, even um, Julie just wrote in here, thank you for a very uh, interesting and informative um, webinar. Um, you guys went from, you know, really outlining just how um, pervasive social media is right at the start with the um, comparison be between um, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube in monthly traffic, you know, being over 10 times that of what the, the networks are now getting in website traffic. Um, Ryan, you, I, I can really tell how passionate um, you, you, you are that, um, you know, Amanda's story doesn't get repeated. Um, so that really came came through, and that, I know that was felt by everybody. And I really felt you guys delivered um, a, 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 an enormous amount of tips, real practical tips in the time that we had, um, that parents and teachers who are on the call can actually do something with. So on behalf of everybody on the call, I really um, thank you guys for, for doing the work and uh, 
and and continuing you continuing to do the work that you do. I really want to thank thank you guys on behalf of everybody on the call and on behalf of Scholar's Choice. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. We we appreciate it. Yeah. Now, if anybody wants to um, reach out, uh, what is the best way? I see that you have a website there, www.youthrelations.org, um, and also by email, the fourth uh, R at uwo.ca. Um, is there is that the best way to to reach out to you guys in those two methods? Yeah, I think so. The fourth R at uwo.ca email goes to Shanna, and she distributes them. Uh, between myself and her, uh, depending on the question. So that's definitely a great way to reach us. Within community.scholarschoice.ca as well, you'll if you go there, you'll see regular educational webinars. If you found value in tonight's webinar, I encourage you to go and check out some of the blogs. Every blog article and webinar Scholars Choice produces is really committed to causing educational excellence for, for our youth. Uh, and empowering us all as adults to to do that. So you can check check that out and um, future um, content uh, content announcements such as webinars are usually done first on Scholars Choices Facebook community. Uh, there's a thriving community there of parents and teachers that are like minded like like you. Um, and there's over seven thousand now and and climbing. So feel free to go there. And that's at facebook.com forward slash scholarschoice.ca. I really want to thank everybody again for being on the call and on behalf of Scholars Choice, really want to thank uh, Cam H, uh, Ryan and Shanna, uh, thank you for being on the call. Have a wonderful evening everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.